give the Lord a praise offering this morning. Amen. Real quick, real quick, real quick now. Uh, where were you when you were saved? Real quick, who be first? Where were you when you were saved? On a school bus, Hazel Curtis? In your bedroom? A vacation Bible school right here at Inglewood. At work, painting Bob Mingle's house. Yes. When? In a worship service. Where were you when you were saved? In church. Where were you when you were saved? Yes. In the middle of nowhere. Amen. We were all kind of in the middle of nowhere, amen? I used to live in the middle of nowhere, amen? Where were you when you were saved? A couple more. Where were you when you were saved? At youth camp. Church camp. Anybody else? Yes. Church camp in England in a Baptist church. We're going to stop on that one right there, right there. Don't ever, don't ever forget when the Lord saved you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these songs. And now we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and if you have your Bibles, would you open them to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And I want to begin with verse... One, And we're going to read all the way down to verse 20. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word of God, I preached to you. That is, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, or Peter, then to the twelve, then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, that is, as of the writing of this letter. Some have fallen asleep or died, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Can I get a witness on that? By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom if He did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, it's empty, it's, it's meaningless, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Let's uh, think with me, if you will. I want to, first of all, ask you to put on your thinking hat, and then we'll put on our, our uh, 
emotions, if you will. We Christians make some incredibly amazing claims. I don't know whether you've ever thought about this, but any time that you're explaining the gospel to someone and they look at you like a dog hearing a strange sound with his head cocked to one side, don't be surprised. What is familiar to you that you've heard maybe since vacation Bible school or church camp sounds weird to the world. In fact, to join what Paul said in the first part of 1 Corinthians, he said that we, we are perceived as being foolish by the world. So, so, the, so I want you to understand that that's why we need to be crystal clear, crystal clear in what we believe and in what Scripture says. So let's look at the claim that we make. Let's, let's begin and look at the assertion that we make as the, as the Christian. Look, if you will, in verses 3 and 4. We make these three claims. We claim that Jesus died according to the Scriptures. Now, there's a whole lot that can be packed into that phrase. We could talk about how Jesus fulfills all the prophecies, a, a hundred prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of the Messiah that Jesus has either already fulfilled and we know will fulfill those prophecies. Or we could talk about how Jesus, when he was here on earth, what he did, all of those things. We claim that Jesus Christ died according to the Scriptures, and not only that, we claim, as Keith has said, as we have sung, that his death was a substitutionary, atoning death. That there was somebody or some people under a death sentence, and Jesus was put forward as a sacrifice to take the punishment that we deserved. Now, we claim also, look at the second phrase, we claim that Jesus was buried. Now, I know that's all it says, and he was buried, but there's a reason that the Holy Spirit had Paul write that. There are no wasted words in Scripture, right? The fact that Jesus is buried is going to be evidence for his resurrection. Now, we know that Jesus died, and I'll get into that in just a minute, what all that means. And we know that he was buried, if you go back to all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it says that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came and begged publicly for the right to bury the body of Jesus. They took him off the cross, being assured that he was dead, and they buried him in a borrowed tomb, a freshly cut stone tomb that Joseph of Arimathea owned. Jesus had not gone down and made a pre-need funeral arrangement. Because he, as I've often said, Jesus only wanted to borrow it for three days. And where I grew up, the word borrow means to use for the intent of returning it. So he was buried. And then we make the claim, now look what it says in verse 3 and 4. It says, we make the claim that Jesus was raised from the dead according to the Scriptures. Now, this is, this is not a new thing. The Bible repeatedly, and Jesus himself, re at least three times, and you could be, count even more than that, repeated that he had come to give his life and then to take it up again. He said, the Son of Man came to bear the sins of many, and then he will be raised again on the third day. Now, that's what we claim. And we claim that those claims that we make, Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and all of that means biblical prophecy, our sins, the atoning death, he was crucified, all of that stuff. He died. He was dead. 
And we claim that he was buried under Roman authority. Not only crucified under Roman authority, but he was buried under Roman authority. I don't know if you ever read your Bible real clear, but you know who sealed the tomb, don't you? And this is a problem for the skeptic. It wasn't the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the Jewish leaders. It was Rome. Rome knew how to kill people. They were professionals at it. They could beat a man within an inch of his life. That's why we say that he was lashed 40 times less one that somehow they had calculated that I could, you could lead a man all the way almost to death with 39 lashes and on the 40th his life would be gone. And then he was buried. And the Bible says that he was buried and the tomb was sealed. And not only that, but a guard was put by the tomb. So here we have this claim that Jesus died, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and then we claim that Jesus was raised from the dead, according to the Scriptures, that this was no accident. It wasn't plan B. I hate that when Christians say that. They'll say, well, I guess God made the world and we sinned. And he went, no, 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 no. Go read the book of Revelation. Read the last book in the Bible. It says this weird thing that Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. It means that God, now this is way above my pay grade, so I'm just a preacher now, that God had worked his plans to put his son the glory of his son on display to redeem people who had rebelled against him. It was no accident. There was no plan B. It was plan A all along. Now let's stop right here. This is outlandish. This is crazy. This is unbelievable. I mean, the, the questions that people... Do you mean to tell me that Christian faith, the Christian faith, at its base, at the taproot, is totally founded on this? Yes. That's what I believe. That's what Scripture teaches. I know what you're thinking. Well, Pastor, you, that's so minimalistic. You know, just that event? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Christian faith is not based upon how we feed the poor. We do that. How we clothe the naked, we do that. How we share the gospel, we do that. It's, if this is not true, this one claim is not true, then there is no Christian Christianity. None. Zip. Not a nothing. Nothing. That's how big this is. Now, I want you to think with me. Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? I mean, I, 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 I get this. I got this recently. Now, preacher, give me some evidence. Don't, don't just say what the Bible says. Okay? Take out that handout that I gave you. And let me give you some evidence. And then after I give you this evidence, I'm going to make a shocking statement that won't shock you, but it's true. Here it is. You'll notice on your handout, there are six great truths that based on this text right here in all of Scripture that seem to point to the fact that all the evidence points to the truth of these claims. So let's just walk down through them. Number one, they're right here on your handout. If we claim that Jesus died, that means that he lived, right? Are you following that logic? If a person died, that means he lived. Well, I have in my list, I have in my hand, two lists, at least, of evidence that Jesus actually died or lived, other than even the Bible, which, by the way, this is a historical document as well. So I was sitting here looking at, at Pliny the Younger who wrote of the life of Jesus. He claimed this, there was this man in, that claimed to do miracles. Or Tacitus in 115 A.D., just a few years after Jesus' life. Or J Flavius Josephus 
who wrote in 93 before John, the revelator, who wrote the book of Revelation, he claimed that Jesus lived, claimed to do miracles. And what about um, the Babylonian Talmud who, that was written, some of it written as early as 70 A.D., all the way to 200 A.D., claimed that, yes, there was a man named Jesus. Nobody, no critic, not even Bart Ehrman, who you don't, not Bart Durham, we're not, not a lawyer, Bart Ehrman, the great New Testament unbelieving scholar, he affirms it's true, Jesus actually did live. Second truth, Jesus died. Jesus died. Nobody disputes this. He died. Number three, look at your hand up. He was buried. He was buried. We have in, in, Roman, in the Roman records, Jesus was buried. Rome's reputation was on the line. Here's another affirmation that not only was he buried, but as a part of that, a subset of that, there was an empty tomb. In fact, one I didn't read of all these pieces of evidence, it says these Christians, these crazy Christians, claim that the tomb was empty, and they, they claim that he appeared. Remember those texts? We look back at 1 Corinthians 15. It says he appeared to Peter, then he appeared to the 12, then he appeared to 500, and then he appeared to me, and then he appeared to, to James, the half-brother of Jesus, and then he, he appeared to... He, he made all these appearances. So get the timeline here. And I don't want to bore you with stats, but these are really important. You remember after Jesus was raised from the dead? From the time that he ascended, was raised from the dead, to the time he ascended, there were 40 days that Jesus was on the earth. That's what it says in that court of Acts, Acts chapter 1. It says Jesus remained with them 40 days. We think he immediately was raised from the dead and went to heaven. No, no, no. Jesus hung around holding Bible studies, and teaching about the kingdom of God, and appearing to his disciples. Let me ask you a question. If we had a sign up for Bible study and Jesus was teaching it, how many of you would come? So he, he appeared. He, you know, one of, the most, one of the ways that you could falsify our claims? Produce the body. Just produce a body. And not even the Roman government did that. What did they do? The Roman guards came back and gave testimony. Dude, we were out there walking around. I thought I was half asleep. Boom, the angel came down the door. We felt like dead men. You know what they did? They paid them off. Don't tell anybody this. How do you explain the empty tomb? And then Jesus appeared. And then the radical transformations. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Everybody agrees that Paul lived. Everybody knows who he was. How do you explain his transformation? How do you explain the transformation of James, his half-brother, who in Matthew 13 came with his other brothers and sisters? After Mary had Jesus, she had other children by Joseph. How do you explain them coming to get Jesus to take him home because they thought he was crazy? And now... James is one of the leaders in the New Testament church. And how do you explain the movement of the church? In fact, for the last 2,000 years, how do you explain crazy believers who gather on a Sunday morning at 1015 to worship God and we claim that 2,000 years ago, a man, a God-man, did what nobody else has ever done. He rose from the dead so the evidence points there he lived he died he was buried the tomb was empty he appeared he transformed people and started what we now know as the church now what if he's not raised from the dead would you please look at your handout I, I'm going to flip this on its head Go down to that section where it says a sad hypothetical. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, there is no resurrection of the dead. Which you could make a case that there is no eternal life. If this is not true, then there is no resurrection of the dead. Every time I go out to do a funeral or preach in church, it's all a lie. There's no hope. 
If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, Christ is still raised, still dead. He died. He was just another good prophet. They put him on a cross. There were other guys who had done the same thing. They killed them. He's just another one of those guys. The text says that if Christ has not been raised from the dead, there is no preaching that means anything. We're just up here going blah, 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 blah. That's what a lot of people think we're doing. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 1 Corinthians 1. Just a bunch of nonsense. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, it says your faith is futile. It's empty. It's vain. Everything that you and I have believed is empty and vain. And on top of that, we are found to be misrepresenting God if there is a God. If there's even a God, I would argue, and that's another sermon, I would argue that if Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, not only are we misrepresenting God, but there is no God. This is the evidence that the one true God has entered into history. And you're still in your sin. I'm still in my sin. And the dead have perished. The dead have perished. Which means that what Jesus said to Nicodemus on that starry night in John 3.16 is a lie. Remember what he said? For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus promised, right there it is. That's why C.S. Lewis said, when you come to Jesus... You have to make a decision. Either he is a lunatic and he needs to be committed to the institution. No man would claim to do what he did unless, these are not my words, C.S. Lewis, he were a poached egg. Or he's a liar and the most deceptive religious leader that's ever lived. Or he is Lord. Paul says, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, look in verse 19. We are of all people most to be pitied. If Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, what the world says is true. What the world says is true. A bunch of poor people. You, know, you do know what they're saying about us, don't you? They're saying that the things that we believe lead a young man in Atlanta, Georgia to kill people. You Don't let that connection be missed on you. They will take that one event and they will somehow connect it to a young man who had a sexual addiction, who wanted to purge it from his life, and they will connect it to discredit the gospel of Jesus Christ and say once again, those Christians are crazy. In fact, I read the statement from his home church, and it was a great one. I mean, if you get online at Crab Apple Baptist Church, right outside of, you need to go read that. I think that's Crab Apple, is, I, it's a Southern Baptist Church. I mean, they came out with a strong statement that this young man has misconstrued everything that we've taught. But you know what? I, I don't, he, mis, he not only misconstrued it, but so has the press. And we know that the press is our friend. I'll probably get canceled for that statement, okay? You do know, and it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And that's why we've got to be absolutely clear about what we believe. So I want to suggest to you this morning that all the evidence to what we assert leads to the point in fact that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. But let me tell you this. Evidence doesn't transform anybody. I talked with a man not too long ago who's kind of a sequential thinker. Worked for the IRS for many years. He's really good with numbers. He's a rational guy. Rational, rational, rational. And he bragged to me that in the last 29 years, he had only been to three church three times and all of them on Easter. 
But other than that, he didn't have any use for God. And he claimed to have information about God, but information doesn't mean transformation. You can have every piece of evidence. You can have all the information. You can believe everything that's just come out of my mouth. Christ died for us since according to the scripture. He was buried. He was raised from the dead according to the scriptures and die and go straight to hell. Every demon in hell believes everything I've just told you. That's what the Bible says. Even the demons believe. They were the first, would you not agree, you read your gospel? The demons were the first group of, I'm not even going to call them people, the first entities who knew who Jesus was. You know, the disciples, the ladies kind of had an intuition. Mary cherished all these things in her heart. She pondered these. She knew something was going on in her son. And the disciples were kind of dragging up the, duh, duh, what do you mean? But guess what? The demons, <laughs> every time Jesus showed up and there was a demon, what came out of their mouth? Whoa, ho, ho, ho. Ho, what? Son, we didn't pick this fight. This is not the fight we wanted. They knew exactly who he was. So what must happen? We must be transformed. This is where you go from your head to your heart in trust. What do you trust in? What do you really believe? Really believe? Really, really believe? This is what happened. Look at your text. And let's look at three names. Look in verse 5. He appeared to Peter, Cephas. Cephas, Peter, went from being an impulsive denier to being a preacher of the gospel and a leader of the church. How's that possible? Not with information. It has to be transformation. Look at James. He went from being the impossible skeptic. There is no... How many of you, if you had a whole brother, half brother, whatever... And he came along and said, hey, I, hey, bro, I want you to know I'm the son of God incarnate. If my brother did that to me, I would call the psych ward at Vanderbilt. Say, hey, dude, you need to go and get my bro. You see, we, we, we take these things for granted. Paul, Acts chapter 9. The radical intellectual. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. If what they say is true about Pharisees, there's a pretty good chance that Paul had the first five books of the Bible memorized. Anybody, anybody, anybody can do that? I can't do that. That's why when he goes into these places in the New Testament, and he says he reasoned from the Scripture. Can you imagine? It would have been like taking a drink out of a fire hydrant. Paul came armed with the gospel that he had missed in the pages of the Old Testament, and now he opens it up, and Jesus is on every page of that word. Now, I want you to listen very carefully as I close. We live in really challenging days, right? Our temptation, stick with me now, our temptation is to forsake our real power. Now, let me be clear. We as citizens of this country need to participate. In fact, as you leave today, you're going to, get a little handout on the Equality Act and how you need to be praying about that and what that means if that passes. But our real power is not political. Our real power is not economic. Others can outspend us. Our real power is not entertainment. In fact, we talk about this often the people up here, they're not, this is not a show. 
We're not here to sh do a show. You, you want to do the show? Go over to Opryland. We're not here to grade. Well, that was a great. So, woo, but Laura was really on. I'm going to give that a nine and a half. Kevin was off today. That's a six. We're not here to do a show. We're, we're here to, together to every Sunday to reaffirm what we have asserted and what the church has asserted from its beginning. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, dead, gone, sealed, affirmed, dead. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. And because of his resurrection, we have forgiveness of sins, eternal life, transformation, and power to live here and now. That is the gospel truth. We live in a world of lies where everybody's being canceled, right? Critical race theory, gender dysphoria. You know what the world hates more than anything else? Listen, the world hates the truth. They hate the truth. They hate the truth. That's why in Romans chapter 1, where it says in verse 18, it says, The wrath of God is being visited upon all ungodliness and unrighteousness in men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So what's the remedy? What's the rem do we start a political action committee? Do we, do we pray for a new Congress, a new president? Yeah, we can do that. But we speak the truth. We speak the truth, brothers and sisters, and the truth is there is a God. This, the truth is he's created all things. The truth is we are sinners, lost, bound, hell-bound, broken by our sin. The truth is, is that he sent his son on a rescue mission, died not by accident but according to the Scripture. He was buried, sealed away, locked away on the third day. In just a couple of weeks we'll celebrate it. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, what no man has ever done before or since. And because of that, it changes everything and not even the powers of darkness, not the powers of hell, not the powers of a government, not the powers of anybody, yea, anybody will ever be able to overcome the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we believe. I was talking to someone one time and I was explaining this to them and how they too could believe and be saved. And I quoted to them that verse out of Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, now get this, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made. And with the heart, we believe unto righteousness. And in verse 13 of Romans 10, 30, it says, and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I was explaining this to them, and they were looking at me like, don't, don't ever forget, even though it makes sense to you, unless the Spirit intervenes and gives new birth, they, the scales are on. They can't see it. While you're, every word that comes out of your mouth as you witness, you ought to be praying in the back of your mind, God, open their eyes. Remove the scales. Open their hearts so that they might believe. And I was speaking and praying. I can do, honey, I can do two things at the same time. Isn't that amazing? And they still didn't look at me. And I, and I couldn't help myself. I said, oh, oh. He said, you really believe that? I said, oh, I, I not only believe, you can't even believe what else we believe. Really? Oh, yeah. I believe one day Jesus is coming back. And he's going to be on a white horse. And he's not going to come to take sides, soothe my feelings. He's not going to come and say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. He's going to come with the sword coming out of his mouth, the word of God. He's going to have written on his, he's got a tattoo. 
written on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's not going to come to take sides. He's going to come to take over. And the moment in history at the Bema seat of judgment in the future, in that great getting up morning in the future, when the dead in Christ shall rise, when all of that stuff happens, the one event in time and space that God himself will look back on as the crucible is the death and resurrection of his son. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? If you believe it, thank God. Just say, God, I, I just thank the Lord. I, I remember when I was saved, I grew up in the home preacher. I had information. Deborah, I went to more VBSs than I, I could lead VBS by the time I was 10 years old. <laughs> I got kicked out of VBS. I did. I said a curse word as a little kid, and I went, boom, whew, the judgment of my parents, whoo, Lord. My excuse was it was in the Bible, and it was, but anyway, I, I didn't use it biblically. Can I get a witness on that? Hey Amen. Y'all know where a word I'm talking about, and I'm not going to say it again. I'll get canceled again. But I remember when I was saved, I had information. But on that one day, and I love to rehearse this, and you know I are to rehearse yours. Don't ever get tired of this. Is on a Sunday in December of 1969. That's a long time ago. And that particular day, I got up. I can't tell you the, the day before. I wouldn't cons- I, I didn't have that decision on my mind. But on that day, I guess that was my appointed day, if you will. My dad was getting ready, went in, and I rehearsed the facts with him. I'll never forget that. He's sitting there shaving. I'm sitting on that. Now, Dad, let me get this straight. Boom, boom, boom. Yep, that's right. Never said a word, never twisted my arm. Went on, went to church, went to Sunday school. I was unusually quiet that day. Can I get a witness on that? During church. I, don't, I have no clue what was preached. No clue. I can't tell you what the text was. All I know was God was dealing with my heart. And I was sitting over here about where Pam was. And on that particular day, we were singing, I surrender all. All to Jesus. You know that song. I surrender all. And I think the Lord saved me right over there. I came. And the preacher asked me, why have you come? Why have you come? Same question I asked. Why have you come? I want to I wanna be saved. Look back, when I look back on it, I think the Lord saved me right over there. Time went by, and the baptistry in that church was in the basement, in the ground. They took up those lids. A little while later, tried to put in some hot water. It wasn't hot. It's cold. And I was baptized with my church family standing around to see their kneecaps. I was standing down in the basement of that church in the baptistry, and I was looking at my brand-new church family of a little boy that had been transformed, not by information, but by the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that you? If it is, be thankful. If it's not, be saved. Let's stand together. Our invitations have been very simple. Would you bow your heads? I told some people last week that God wants everybody in this room to have three homes. He wants us to have an earthly home. Whether you're single, married, brothers, sisters, God wants you to have a home and God wants to bless your home and I hope that God will bring peace to your home. God wants us to have a church home. 
He wants us to not be Lone Ranger Christians. He wants us to be a part of a fellowship. God wants us to have a heavenly home. And that heavenly home is assured to us through Jesus Christ. And right where you're standing, if you know the Lord, just thank Him. Thank Him for saving you. Remember the time or the place or, or at least the season. You doing that right now? The people involved? Just thank the Lord for that. And then, if you're not, if you don't know, if you're not for sure, just trust Him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe these affirmations that He died for you. Make it personal. Didn't He just die for the world? He died for you. He was buried. He was raised again. And the Bible says if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that truth, we can be saved. Would you do that right now? Just whisper that prayer of commitment in your heart right now. And in just a minute, when we have this service done, as others have done, you come and say, Pastor, I, I committed my life to Christ today. I need to talk to somebody. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for these claims that they're not just claims that we make out of the air they have no basis in history. They do. All the evidence leans in the right direction that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. But Father, ultimately, we, we believe that by faith. And we're transformed not just by information, but we're transformed by your blessed Holy Spirit who comes and takes the scales off our eyes, puts in a new heart, gives us the ability and the capacity to believe by faith. And Lord, you might be working that miracle right now. Lord, help us to never forget. Help us to share the story. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen. Let me make some announcements and we'll be on our way. When you leave today, you are going to be able to pick up